The great Vince Lombardi once said, football is a game of inches and the inches make the champion. In football and in other sports, inches are gained by the athletes who are usually the fastest. In a time where athletes have become more knowledgeable using the latest study data to improve their training, they still make these mistakes when it comes to training for sprinting speed. What's up guys, welcome to today's video. Today I wanna to talk about the top five things, in my opinion, that are killing your sprinting speed. And in my opinion, they're also just a big waste of time when it comes to training for speed and getting faster and more explosive. So getting right into it, the first thing that's a surefire way of not maximizing your speed potential is glossing over your warm up. Preparation is important for many reasons and there's a million and one ways to go about warming up. Now I'm not here to tell you there's one best way to warm up, but I am here to tell you that there are things that you should include in your warm up that will better prepare you for sprinting. Some of these things include dynamic stretching, exciting your central nervous system, elevating your heart rate, muscle activation, and self myofascial release. Now those things are in no order and not limited to these things. One thing that I recently discovered and started to implement in my own warm up is movement competencies. And some of the prep used by Kyle Dobbs and Dr. Pat Davidson in their uh, content and I use it for, I particularly like their breathing and activation stability warm up stuff for my obliques and uh, adductors because for me, I generally overlook those muscles in my warm up. What's interesting about implementing that stuff is I have done things in the past that are somewhat similar or resemble some of the movements that they do, and I kind of already am uh, comfortable with how they're going to start tying into my warm up going forward. So for those of you who are interested in learning more about stuff like that, I will link both of their uh, handles down in the description so you can check them out. But just like in training, uh, don't be afraid to look for new things to implement in your warm up and try to enhance your warm up to better prepare you for your training. Now diving a little bit deeper into number one, at number two I have putting an emphasis on mobility and stability of your foot and your ankle. In sprinting, these Two things are huge and get, often get overlooked in terms of uh, paying more attention to the knee and the hip because those are probably more powerful joints that you use in sprinting. But the ankle and the foot just become so important and often are so overlooked uh, by a lot of athletes that I run into. But the importance of this stuff is huge. It starts from the ground up and the first thing from the ground is your feet when you start running. So the way your foot contacts the ground is very, very important. And if your foot isn't contacting the ground, uh, optimally for each step, that's gonna be force and torque that you're gonna be bleeding throughout your system. Speaking based off experience, uh, my ankle and foot range of motion and mobility, stability has never really been a strong suit of mine. However, just becoming a little bit conscious of it and implementing just some mobility and uh, anterior tibialis strengthening movements has gone a far way for me and far away for my stability and in terms of getting it to better positions. Angles is what I preach to people. I mean, angles is kind of the name of the game when it comes to uh, sprinting a faster 40 and for the start especially, you want to be able to get your foot and ankle into the positions for you to maximize the angle of your shin so you can accelerate forward more efficiently. As somebody who works a desk job and speaking based off experience, um, throughout the day I'm not 100% conscious of what I'm doing with my feet. So when I get into the gym and start prepping to do sprints, I like to start with ankle mobility and just uh, some stuff for my feet just to feel the ground and kind of make that connection with my foot uh, where it's contacting the ground, how it's going to contact the ground, and just kind of mentally go over how my foot's going to strike. And I think that that makes a really big difference. So mobility and stability at the foot is definitely something I would include in my warm-up. At number three, I have wasting too much time with this. Personally, I think the agility ladder and the agility cones and stuff that you see on the Instagram uh, videos, I, 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 think, I, I think those guys are cool. And I think that it is definitely impressive how some people can move their feet as fast as they, they do. But um, it, this stuff is totally non-specific to sprinting guys. Like I, I just think it's a total waste of time getting better at the agility ladder. Can using the agility ladder improve your stride frequency? I definitely think it can. However, I do think that there are better uses for your time 
doing stuff like the 5105 shuttle or the three cone drill. I know a lot of athletes, especially football players, get tested in those drills. So it's useful to understand and know and get good at those drills. However, those drills are really good for testing the eccentric and isometric phases of muscle action, which are important. It has forces you to stop on a dime, change direction, also multi-planar. So you're moving to get down, touch the line, stay low to the ground, uh, just more things that are a little bit more specific to your sport. As a shock to some of you, coming in number four, I have doing too much powerlifting. Now, I know you know uh, being fast is a thing of movement in a reactive sense. What's a good way to not be able to react fastly? Uh, it's being stiff. Unfortunately, this is something that powerlifting does to you when you do it too frequently. Now, what is too frequently? That is uh, determined by you. It's something that if your body can handle it and still remain flexible and mobile, then that's something that you can do. Congratulations. Uh, you can powerlift three times a week and not lose mobility or stability or flexibility. But for some of us, like myself, unfortunately, uh, powerlifting frequently, uh, in my opinion, uh, for myself, I kind of found out that uh, powerlifting twice a week is kind of my limit. Uh, in most cases, it's probably best for me when I'm training, uh, sprinting and jump training to only powerlift once a week. I essentially found this out over the past year of training. Uh, my goal was to add 100 pounds to my squat and then it was to get to the 500 pound squat milestone, something I have never done yet, and also compete in a powerlifting meet. Uh, was also kind of something I wanted to do as like a cherry on the top uh, goal for myself. Since then, I've gained a ton of weight on my squat, I've added over 100 pounds to my squat. However, uh, I have definitely got slower and I can no longer dunk a basketball, unfortunately. Also, I kind of want to say as a disclaimer, during my squat training, my powerlifting training this year, I didn't really do much uh, sprinting or jump training at all. Uh, I kind of kept it to uh, a minimal uh, approach because I wanted all the emphasis to go on my powerlifting training and I think that had I've kept that up I probably would not have gained as much uh, pounds on my squat and deadlift however I would have been able to maintain my jumping and my sprinting abilities definitely a little bit better so my suggestion for you is be smart and find out through trial and error how much you can uh, train the powerlifts uh, the powerlifts are great for improving your maximal strength and force development. There's just a fine line with seeing a reduction in your training and performance. So it's just best in my suggestion to you would be to find the best balance between powerlifting and your training in the gym for the sprint and plyo training. And by developing your own perfect mix of the two, you should be somewhere in the realm of optimal performance, which is something we all want. Finally, at number five, I have doing too much aerobic training and conditioning. Or this could also be not understanding how rest periods impact your sprint training. Conditioning comes into play in every sport. Obviously, you wanna have good endurance. Uh, it just is never a bad thing to have good endurance. However, in order to maximize your performance, you need to rest long enough so that each time you sprint, it's a maximal output or as close to a maximal output as possible. You want each sprint to be uh, as close to the best sprint you can run uh, or the fastest without having fatigue set in. This is why a lot of strength and conditioning coaches say in order to get fast, you need to train fast. And one surefire way to uh, not let that happen is to be fatigued on each set. In my opinion, this is the number one uh, beginner mistake by new athletes and by stubborn coaches who just, just don't really understand strength and conditioning uh, and force their athletes to do so much conditioning. Uh, I could rant on this all day, uh, as you probably can tell. I once had a baseball coach that started off uh, the first day of spring practice was we had to run in a circle for 20 minutes and just progressively get faster uh, as we progress the time. So we were just really just fatiguing ourselves out to just basically be slow for the whole rest of the, the time. Uh, also, I didn't really understand the whole point of doing conditioning at the start of practice. I just, it never made sense to me. Just remember to understand your energy systems. First one being aerobic or your cardiovascular system. Anaerobic lactic, where lactic acid builds up in your muscles, like in bodybuilding style training. And anaerobic alactic, which is where you wanna be for sprint training. Basically, this is just short bursts of exercise, full recovery between sets. A lot of these things I learned 
through experience and unfortunately uh, saw a reduction in my performance. So hopefully you won't have that happen. I know sometimes uh, learning what not to do can clear up what you probably should do. So that was my number one motivator for making this video. Um, if you learned something in this video, don't be afraid to give it a like or share with a friend. If you have an idea of something or a topic that you'd like me to talk about in the future in some of these videos, please leave it down in the comments below. Thank you again for watching. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already or if you want a notification for future content, hit the bell or notification button so it gives you a notification when I post another video. And thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next video.